are some who twist the Bible in ways never intended in order to support self-interest or personal convictions. Today on Truth For Life, Alistair Begg cautions Christians against such abuse and explains the criteria for testing ideas against the truth of God's Word. From the series titled Belief and Behavior, Alistair presents a message titled Listening to the Word of God. Verse 19, 1 Thessalonians 5, Do not put out the Spirit's fire. Do not treat prophecies with contempt. Test everything. Hold on to the good. Avoid every kind of evil. Actually, in preparation, I toyed with just three points, which would make uh, the final two sub-points of a third one. But it still ends up with five either way you go at it, and I thought probably five was a more honest way of saying it, although we will take uh, less time the closer we get to the end. Let's ask for God's help, shall we? Father, with a deep sense of expectation, we turn again to your Word. We thank you for the privilege of praising you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We know that only by the ministry of the Spirit of God will the page of Scripture be illumined to our waiting hearts to take us beyond the realm of simply a group of people listening to the voice of a man, to each one of us, listening to the voice of God. We pray that might be our portion tonight as we seek you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we come now to the second of these five directives which Paul provides, and to the phrase in verse 20, do not treat prophecies with contempt. Or in Philip's paraphrase, and I'm sure somebody's going to have this as my epitaph, um, as J.B. Phillips said. Um, I can hear it myself saying, I'm getting rather tired of it myself. I wish, that, uh, I wish I'd been smart enough to paraphrase it instead of Phillips, and then I could just have said it without having to give him credit all the time. But he said it, I didn't, and so I have to keep crediting him. And I, I rightly should. This is how he puts the phrase, "...never despise what is spoken in the name of the Lord." Never despise what is spoken in the name of the Lord. Insofar as the Holy Spirit speaks to the church, the very Word of God itself, then clearly any attempt to detract from that Word or to diminish it in any way or to disregard it will inevitably have a dampening effect on the Spirit's fire. Indeed, there's probably no more striking follow-on to the phrase, do not put out the Spirit's fire, than immediately a word concerning the place of the Word of God to the people of God. For certainly, if we are to be those who are aflame with the Spirit, we're going to make sure that we are listening properly to God's Word. Now, the question, of course, is what is Paul saying here? He was clearly addressing an issue that was germane to the Thessalonian context. We can uh, surmise, perhaps, a little. We can't say with certainty. It may be that in Thessalonica, as in Corinth, there were those who thought more of the spectacular gifts, uh, most expressly the whole issue of speaking in tongues, than that of the forthright speaking of the Word of God. And things may have got a little out of sync in the Thessalonian context to the point that people were tending to dramatize the spectacular and diminish what they regarded as something being far more mundane. If that is the case, then Paul would be saying, I don't want you to set aside the clear word that comes from God and treat it with contempt. Rather, I want you to treat it with the honor that is due. Or it may well be Uh, in relation to this whole question or preoccupation with the return of the Lord Jesus Christ, that there had been those in Thessalonica who were given over, if you like, to prophetic outbursts, and particularly in relationship to the parousia, the return of Jesus Christ. And as is true today, so then, there were a a whole host of speculative elements to the uh, question of the return of Jesus Christ— And it may be that there were some who uh, were paying more than lip service to this and were making these prophetic statements regarding prophetic uh, matters and chilling people out as a result of it. And so people were tempted to throw the baby out with the bathwater. 
In other words, they were saying to themselves, oh, we don't want to really listen to these words from God because so many of them are full of conjecture and hype, and we can't be sure that they're being fulfilled. And so it may well be that if that was the context, that Paul has to admonish them and say, the fact that there are some who are given over to certain bizarre statements should not provide a basis for you from setting aside the prophetic word altogether. John Stott, as always, comes through in a time like this, and he says, Here is a clear command to the church to listen to whatever messages purport to come from God and not to despise or reject them unheard and untested. Now, the major difference between Paul's time and our own in relationship to this is the fact that we have the completed canon of Scripture— that we have the Bible in its completed form, the written Word of God, uh, which we are able to affirm in terms of its sufficiency and in terms of its supremacy. So we're not dealing now in a time when, as in Thessalonica, there were apostles who were making statements as from God. Oh, but says somebody, I watch uh, quite a bit of Christian television, and I've seen that there are, in fact, a number of apostles, uh, because they announce themselves as such on television. And they claim to make statements directly from God. What are we to do concerning that? If, as we proclaim the Word of God, we do so in a framework of confusion in relationship to apostolic utterance— then it is of pressing importance that we understand what the Bible says. And what the Bible says in the book of Ephesians 2.20 is that the apostles and the prophets are the foundation of the church. There are no such inspired foundational people left. If there were, then we would have to listen to them. And not only would we have to listen to them, but we would continually have to keep adding what they say to the Bible— the Bible would no longer be sufficient and supreme because we would have to listen to these prophetic statements coming from here, there, and everywhere, and we'd have to constantly turn our Bible into a loose-leaf version whereby we added these various pages. We no longer live in that condition. The foundation has been laid once and for all. No one has the right to tamper with it, to add to it, or to subtract from it. Well, you say to me, uh, Pastor, I know that there are those who believe that God is again giving the gift of prophecy to the church in the same way and in the same measure as he did at Pentecost. What do you think about that? Well, I must humbly say, I think it's wrong. And you must search the Scriptures to see whether these things are so. I do not believe that there is any warrant for us whatsoever believing that there are apostles as per the foundations of the church, nor that there are people who are able to speak directly from God, thus supplementing in its best case and subtracting from, in its worst case, the foundations of Scripture. In it all, in this statement, what we have is a clear exhortation to listen to the Word of God, not in a spirit of gullible acceptance or of critical rejection, but with discrimination. Especially if somebody has a gift of oratory, we need to pay careful attention to what they're saying. And we need to check constantly what they're saying so that we do not become a congregation of people who simply because we heard it there believe it in the same way as people say, well, I saw it on the news. And therefore, if it was on the news, of course, it must be believable. Not necessarily so. In fact, probably not. And in the same way, they say, well, it was a preacher who said it. Yes, we understand, but what did it have to do with the Bible? So when he says, do not treat prophecies with contempt, whatever he meant then, what it means now is simply this, that we should pay attention to the Word of God when it is proclaimed. And any lack of attention is to treat the Word of God with contempt— That, you see, is why it is so significant to me in the preaching task. I'm not such an ogre in my car. I'm not so concerned about things. If I was up here giving a dissertation on Kmart, I don't care whether you listen or whether you don't. If I'm up here selling you in the futures market, frankly, you can shout and do what you like, but I'm not. I'm up here as a servant of the book. And this is it. Do not treat the Word of God with 
contempt, either in the way you deliver it or in the way you receive it. That's the issue. That's, you see, why it's so important. Well, then, if we're neither to be just gullible taking anything in or to be those who are nitpicking, leaving everything out, what are we to do? That brings you to the third point. Do not treat prophecies with contempt. Well, when prophecies come, when the Word of God is spoken to us, what should our approach be? Test everything. It's the same word that he uses of God searching our hearts in the second chapter of First Thessalonians. And in verse 4, on the contrary, we speak as men approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. We're not trying to please men, but God who tests our hearts. It's the same word that is used in 2 Timothy in terms of studying to show yourself approved unto God. Dokimos is the word. And it is a word that stands for approved under testing or approved after testing. There's a little symbol on your windscreen in your car at least there is in, in Britain, it says BSA approved on it, British Standard Approval. And so it has gone through various stress tests, and that insignia tells you that you have a windshield that you ought to be able to trust. Now he says, I want you in listening to the Word of God to make sure that you're not uncritically accepting of everything. You're not uncritically accepting of everyone who claims to speak the Word of God. Rather, you're learning to weigh it carefully, and you're asking yourself, does this tie in with the rest of Scripture? Does this tie in with everything I have been taught? And that is why I say to you with frequency, you are sensible people. You check for yourselves. I say that as much as a safeguard to me as I do as an encouragement to you. For it is the Word of God in its pure and pristine form which is infallible. It is without error. Therefore, we have to treat it with this concern. That's why in the last, second last book of the Bible, in the book of Jude, he writes, Dear friends, although I was eager to write to you about the salvation we share, I felt I had to write and urge you to contend for the faith that was once for all entrusted to the saints. Now, how are you going to contend for the faith that was once for all entrusted to the saints unless you first of all know what the faith that was once for all entrusted to the saints really is? And can we know what that is? Yes, it is right here in the Scriptures. It is the good deposit. It is the essential truth of the gospel. Now, why is it such a concern? The answer is, for certain men whose condemnation was written about long ago have secretly slipped in among you. In other words, they're actually present, and they came under cover of darkness. Now, if you think that this only happened in the first century and hasn't happened in the century since, then you're crazy. Therefore, there ought to be the assumption that that which is described here in Jude will be a recurring feature of the church, so that there will be people who secretly creep in, who are godless men, who change the grace of God into a license for immorality, and they deny Jesus Christ our only sovereign and Lord. He says, I want you to make sure that you're on the lookout for these characters. Just have your antennae up. Test. People say, well, why do we have to have an interview? Why can't we just go ahead and teach? You know, I taught in my other church. I'm delighted to know that you did. But we'd love to hear what you taught. Before we give you a classroom of well-meaning people just to listen to you talk. Why? Because it says so. It's just simple. We say, well, are there guidelines that we can use, evaluation points that will be true to Scripture and help us in the process? Absolutely. I'm glad you asked. Let me tell you what they are. Whenever you listen to somebody proclaim the Word of God, and you determine that you're going to test everything, these tests are vital. Number one, the test of Scripture itself. In other words, to ask the question, is what is being declared here in direct accord with the plain truth of the Bible? Or is this fellow or this girl up to funny business? Now, let me tell you how to detect funny business. Beware of people who want to tell you stuff that they tell you you've never heard before, never found before, and nobody really knew before. At that point, it's a good time to go out for coffee. Because they are not about to give you the essentials of the faith once delivered to the saints. They are about to give you a bunch of stuff that they dreamt up from who knows where. 
And beware also of people who take obscure passages of Scripture, remove them from their context, add to them all kinds of unbelievable bits and pieces of Scripture, and then draw the most outlandish conclusions from them, so that your head is absolutely nipping. There is no way in the world you can remember the point from which this conversation began. It's now gone through 14 books of the Bible. You've had 75 verses jammed at you. You've got the feeling that you're being that somebody is slinging you a line, they are. They are. Well, the chances are that they are. And you've got to say to yourself, does this square with the rest of Scripture? Now, I've mentioned Acts chapter 17. Let me give you an Old Testament reference regarding this. How seriously does God care about these things? Deuteronomy and chapter 13 and verse 1. If a prophet or one who foretells by dreams appears among you and announces to you a miraculous sign or wonder, and if the sign or wonder of which he has spoken takes place, and he says, Let us follow other gods, gods you have not known, and let us worship them, you must not listen to the words of that prophet or dreamer. The Lord your God is testing you to find out whether you love him with all your heart and with all your soul. It is the Lord your God you must follow, and him you must revere. Keep his commands and obey him, serve him, and hold fast to him. That prophet or dreamer must be put to death because he preached rebelliously against the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt and redeemed you from the land of slavery. He has tried to turn you away from the Lord your God, commanded you to follow. You must purge the evil from among you. And then he says, if it happens in your own family, if your very own brother or your son or your daughter or the wife you love or your closest friend secretly entices you, saying, let us go and worship other gods, gods that neither you nor your fathers have known, and so on and so on. He says, you've got to absolutely chuck it. And the issue is, in testing everything, we test it against the plain instruction of the Bible. And I believe that the plain instruction of the Bible, not theological niceties, but the plain instruction of the Bible can be taught to our children at their earliest of ages and shared with them from the beginnings at our knees so that a discriminating child well taught will be able to apply the test of Scripture. They will do it automatically. They will do their own spell check in the way that you put it into your uh, program, and it, it, the automatic spell check is working. As we train our children properly, they will have their own theological check that is going on against the plain test of Scripture. And believe me, in this New Age chaos in which we're living, if ever there was a need for this check, it's right now and today. Second is against the divine and human person of Jesus. In other words, to test the word that is being spoken in relationship to the person's approach to who Jesus is and what he has done. Don't be confused or put off by the fact that they use the right phraseology. If the devil is an angel of light, you expect him to use the correct phraseology. For it will only be with the correct phraseology that he will be able to hoodwink those who are not applying the correct tests. If he uses the wrong phraseology, if, for example, he says, would you like to come to our church where Jesus is a demon? You know you're not going to have to be well-versed in the Bible to know, well, I don't, think that's, uh, I don't think that's what I've been taught. But if someone says to you, would you like to come to our church? You know we're really into Jesus. He is a son of God. And you're not paying attention. You say you heard the phrase son of God. You said, well, I know he is the son of God, and off you go. And then the further you get woven into it, and they pull you in with this and that and the next thing, before you know where you are, you're so submerged under these 14 books of the Bible and 75 verses and all these plans and diagrams and sheets and charts. You are now underneath a web system so severe that when you wake up and you discover that they believe that Jesus Christ was a created being rather than that he was in himself co-equal with the Father and the Spirit in the creation of the world, you will have a literal devil of a job to get out of that predicament. And many have gone that route. And the reason they have is simply this process. They quench the fire of God's Spirit, they grew contemptuous 
of the Word of God proclaimed. They failed then to apply the reasonable tests to what they were being fed, and they were sucked in to a moral and theological vortex. Isn't it interesting that in the inception of this church back in the early days, one of the great draws, if I understand it correctly, one of the great uh, catalytic elements of bringing people around and instructing them was to bring in Walter Martin so that he could give his talk and leave behind his tapes on the kingdom of the cults so that he would be able to identify these different deviant groups and show this fledgling church the nature of the true in relationship to the counterfeit. You don't hear much about the kingdom of the cults anymore. Why? Because the cults cleaned up their act? No. Because Bible-believing Christians have got increasingly vague about what they believe. And as the level of knowledge goes down in the framework of genuine biblical faith, the advance of cultish activity, as it is taught, under all kinds of disguises, will be in the ascendancy. And especially when you add to that a synergism at the level of moral and political concerns, then you can see how it would be very possible for a whole section of mainstream Christianity to have been absorbed in an alliance with those who actually do not believe in the relationship to who Jesus is, what is true historic Christianity. And then, once entangled in that web, the evil one has gained a great victory. You say, I think that's a little bizarre, a little extreme. It may be, but it may not be. You're listening to Alistair Begg, and this is Truth For Life. We're in a series titled Belief and Behavior. Today's message is called Listening to the Word of God. If you missed any of the studies in 1 Thessalonians, you can find all of Alistair's messages at truthforlife.org. There's no cost to listen online. You also have the option of purchasing this three-volume series on CD or USB at our cost without any markup. It's our pleasure to bring you these daily Bible teachings from Alistair Begg without cost being a barrier, but we're only able to do that because of the generosity of listeners like you. When you give to support this ministry, you open the door for people around the world to have access to clear, relevant Bible teaching. And God is using your gift to change lives for eternity. Because of that, we're so grateful for your partnership. To express our thanks for your gift today, we'd like to send you a helpful resource. It's a book titled The Christian Life. It's written by Sinclair Ferguson. This is a deep but approachable study of Christian doctrine and the key themes for successful Christian living. With insight and wisdom, Ferguson expounds upon doctrines like grace, the new birth, and repentance— to provide much-needed clarity in understanding these complex topics. Request your copy of The Christian Life when you donate to support the ministry of Truth For Life by calling 888-588-7884 or go to truthforlife.org. If you'd prefer to mail your donation along with your request for the book, write to us at Truth For Life, P.O. Box 39 Cleveland, Ohio, 44139. For those of you who haven't heard, Truth For Life has a YouTube channel that you can subscribe to. Not only can you hear these daily messages from Alistair, you can also have the pleasure of experiencing this teaching through a visual medium as well. Subscribe to the Truth For Life channel today and get notified when a new sermon is uploaded. It's a great way to hear and see Alistair teaching God's Word. I'm Bob Lapine for Alistair Begg and all of us here at Truth For Life encouraging you to worship with your church family this weekend, and then listen again Monday when Alistair concludes his message on a believer's responsibility to test what they hear when God's Word is proclaimed. Today's program was furnished by Truth For Life, where the learning is for living.